In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with David Finley, one of the co-founders of SpeechPad. He's founded multiple companies that have been acquired. He talks about going from that idea to starting to get sales. He talks about feeling the pain of your customer and how important it is to go through that customer experience. That and much more coming up right now. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm here with David Feinleib. Let me just introduce David to you because after you hear this, you're going to want to hang on his every word like I do. David was a self-taught developer from age 12. His first entrepreneurial job was shoveling snow in Boston in the winters. He's an inventor on 15 U.S. patents. He's, a co he's co-founded multiple companies, including Likewise, which was acquired by EMC, Concera, which was acquired by HP, just to name a few. Currently, he helps run SpeechPad and the Big Data Group. He's also, if that wasn't enough, he's also the author of Why Startups Fail and How Yours Can Succeed, which we'll talk a little about later, and also the author of Big Data Demystified, How Big Data is Changing the Way We Live, Love, and Learn. David, thanks for joining us. Jeremy, thanks for having me on the show. It's great to be here. So I always include a fun fact about a guest, and the fun fact for you is you're a six-time marathon finisher and Ironman. Yeah, That's last amazing. year, I uh, thanks for mentioning that, I completed Ironman France in Nice, France last June, and uh, I have to say it was one of the most challenging and rewarding undertaking uh, undertakings in my life. Uh, and I couldn't have done it really without uh, a group called the San Francisco Triathlon Club. Uh, they were incredibly supportive. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, like, all of that seems hard, but, like, the Iron Man out of that long list would seem like the most difficult almost. I, uh, I never thought of myself as an athlete, and uh, an Iron Man was a huge challenge. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more to it. There's the race itself, but, of course, there's also the heat uh, it's over 90 degrees. Uh, the, the day that we did it was over 90 degrees all day. Uh, so, you know, a lot of exposure, a lot of sun. Um, you've got to stay hydrated and, and all of that. And uh, it was tough, but uh, it, was, it was amazing. It was well, amazing. We'll hear, we'll hear about how you applied some of those, I'm sure, tactics for training and everything in all of your, you know, business success, too. So we get a lot of people, they have tons of ideas. Sometimes they don't know where to start or they're having a hard time getting traction. They feel kind of stuck or they don't even know if they're heading in the right direction. And I know, you know, we're going to listen to you and how you replicated kind of going from that idea to successful company many times over. So hopefully sharing that success formula with us and going from that idea to making our sale or beyond. And one thing I want to mention with SpeechPad is it's one of the most seamless checkout processes I've ever experienced. And I've referred people, just, I just said, I don't care if you need something transcribed or not, and you'll talk about SpeechPad, but I go, just purchase it and see how seamless their checkout process is. Did a lot of thought go into that or did it just happen that way? Like, tell me about that because if people could replicate that, I think it would be unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, well, first of all, thanks for, thanks for saying that. Uh, and I've got to uh, say uh, kudos to our UI designer. Uh, he uh, was really instrumental in the overall design for the site, Joey. Uh, he just uh, has kind of a vision of the total experience, uh, the end-to-end -end product. And making that experience seamless and really easy is uh, something that, that we all put a lot of time and effort into, but he especially did that. Um, the version of the site you're seeing is uh, actually the second or third version that we've had out there. So the first version that we had uh, was straightforward, but it wasn't particularly engaging. The second version uh, had a lot more features and complexity and all that. It had some, some benefits, but this version really pulled everything together, and one of the key things was make it easy. Make it really mm -hmm. easy to use and just get three people through the process because basically when it comes to transcription, people want to upload their files, they want to know it's going to work, and they want to get their transcripts back. 
and they just want that to be a seamless experience, just like what you're talking about. Yeah, and it definitely does that. Um, so just to tell people a little bit about SpeechPad, how did you, going back, how did you originally come with come up with the idea for it? We were uh, using a service to transcribe uh, our voicemails into text. And uh, there are a number of services. You can imagine which ones we were using. Uh, and the transcriptions weren't very good. You could sort of tell who had called and maybe a couple of the words, but the overall transcription quality was quite low, and it was hard to tell what someone was actually saying. So we built a service to address that particular need. One of my co-founders, uh, you know, I was telling him about uh, needing to uh, deal with this personal pain point that I had around getting my own voicemails transcribed, and he said, oh, I've been thinking about this problem for years. Um, you know, we should work on it together, and it turns out he has a, you know, an issued patent on a marketplace for transcription services. He had all these great ideas. You know, he has this vision that someday we'll be able to do 60 minutes of transcription in one minute by having multiple people work on it at the same time. Mm. Um, so, you know, some pretty um, forward-thinking ideas on how to do transcription. But that was really the, the original idea was how do we solve this pain for ourselves? So why did you even want your voicemails transcribed? Well, I, uh, you know, I get a lot of calls, as I'm sure we all do, you know, lots of different things. It could be for sales, it could be your friends calling, it could be work, meetings, you know, just everyone has so much going on these days um, that I would, you know, be there and I'd be looking on my phone and I'd see there was a, a voicemail, but I really want to be able to see, you know, who called and what did they say and, you know, figure out what to do with it. Right. Uh, and, you know, I'm kind of a email, I use email all the time, and so I sort of thought of voicemail as an extension of email for me. And so that's a big part of why I wanted uh, to have it in text form. Right. Yeah, I mean, it looked like you had a big pain point around that. Do you remember a time that you just, it, it bit you because you didn't have it transcribed? Like you missed a big client or a big call or someone's birthday? What What was that big pain so we could experience it? <laughs> yeah, you know, I um, at the time I was uh, in a job where I was doing investing. And a lot of uh, investing, as with so many other things, requires you to be very responsive. Uh, I can't think of a particular instance where not having the voicemail cost me a deal, okay. for example. But, you know, when people call, you really do need to get back to them, and you have to be very responsive to uh, kind of a lot of inbound inquiries. Uh, and so just being able to see all that in visual form and see the text uh, is really important. Right. I just wanted to feel your pain because I feel like I would have been like, yeah, this is kind of annoying. I hope someone creates this. But you, it was enough of pain for you to actually go out and, and do it. Yeah, well, I, I had tried multiple services. I mean, I... Uh, you know, was getting tons and tons of calls. It's hard to explain how many phone calls you get as an investor. Um, you know, people joke that a big part of investing is saying no uh, to the investments, uh, which is, you know, difficult and sort of emotionally challenging. Um, but you're just getting a huge volume of inbound inquiries. And so just being able to sort through those and see them and respond to them uh, quickly and easily is really important. Um, and so, so it was enough of a pain where I really wanted to, to see it solved. Also, it was incredibly frustrating because, you know, you would get these transcripts and they were really bad. And so you'd see the bad transcript and it's almost worse than not having the transcript is having what someone said inaccurately represented. It's almost more frustrating um, to have it be wrong. And so it just made it more and more of a, a challenge that I wanted to go solve. Yeah, you spend more time deciphering it. Um, right. So what was the moment early on? Because obviously you've had several successful ventures. Um, what was the moment early on that maybe it felt impossible to get a customer or you hit a big roadblock with, with the company? Well, we had uh, really two things going on with SpeechPad. One was uh, we had a, uh, a large direct customer that had come through someone that I had worked with a number of years ago. And so that customer, 
We were building and addressing a lot of requirements for that specific customer. And so oftentimes we would be doing a lot of work to make the product work for that customer's requirements. And we'd often wonder, are those requirements applicable to other potential customers? So we're spending all this time on this large direct customer. And meanwhile, we were sort of expecting, as so many entrepreneurs do and as we all have, that people would just show up and use the site and start ordering transcriptions. And lo and behold, without doing any marketing or any online promotion, not that many people were showing up and using the thing. So we had this one big customer, we're doing a lot of custom work for them, and then we'd show up at our meetings every week and go, where is everyone? How come more people aren't using this thing? And of course, the obvious answer was we weren't doing any marketing. And so that's why no one knew we existed. Were there features? Go ahead. It seems self-explanatory, and yet when you're in the thick of it, sometimes it's just so easy to forget that you've got to do just basic marketing. You've got to get the word out, let people know it's out there. You've got to ask a customer, hey, if you had a good experience with us, would you mind telling a couple of your friends? And you know you do that enough, and people really get to know about your product. Were there features that the big customer was asking for that you thought would hit it big but ended up being something that most people didn't want? Well, a lot of, you know, we have a number of larger customers now, and a lot of larger customers tend to need things like APIs where they want programmatic interfaces for uploading their files in very large volume and getting the transcripts back in very large volume. So that's one thing where we've done a lot of work. It's really paid off because we have integration, but it was a lot of work. It's not something that, you know, someone doing a couple of transcriptions a week is going to think of when they're, you know, when they're initially using the service. So that was one thing. Another thing that, you know, big customers really need is comprehensive invoicing. And, you know, you might not think invoicing, you know, what's the big deal? But it turns out that to get through procurement and payments and vendor management and so on at really large companies, large public companies, they've got to have detailed invoices and they've got to adhere to certain formats and all of this stuff. And so a lot of that, you know, you have a specific format for a specific customer. So we would do a lot of work on invoicing just so we could get paid which was really important, getting paid for the work we had done. But those are things that the customer coming to the site who puts in a credit card and just wants a great transcription experience might not worry about those, at least at the beginning. How did you figure out how to charge early on? Because if you have these big customers and then smaller customers, I'm sure there's differences there. Yeah, so our kind of overall principle was make it easy. Transcription is a market that exists. It's a very large market. And we looked around and we saw that it was very complex, you know, lots of different charges for lots of different activities, and you couldn't get an immediate quote for your audio or video. So it's kind of frustrating to try and just get a transcription done. So our goal was... Make it simple. If there's, you know, if it's hard for us to hear the audio, if there's a ton of speakers, if it's just plain harder than average, then we charge extra for that. But for the vast majority of transcriptions, we should be able to do that for, you know, with a pretty basic pricing mechanism. We felt that after doing a bunch of market research that a dollar a minute was a price point we wanted to be able to offer, at least as an entry-level price point. Now, customers want faster turnaround. They want time stamps. They want specialized invoices. You know, there's a lot of things that, again, often for larger customers that they need or want that we charge more for. But we really wanted to be able to offer basic, high-quality transcription at a buck a minute. Yeah, yeah, and then people want premium features. They can, you know, pay a little bit more for those things. That that's right. You know, closed captioning, specialized style guides for different verticals and different industries, where you have translation, things like that. 
those all are, are additional. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a good point for uh, for any business is they should have a starting point and then some premium features that you know will build on that. Um, so that's right. And we're, you know, we're we're also all about trying to, and from my own experience, you know, I really like to think about taking the friction out of the product. So you want someone to be able to show up. They, they need your service, they want to use it. You don't want to give them any reason to, to turn away, right? You want to get them, get them in and using the product and just make right. it really uh, a really great experience. Right, they'll figure out as many reasons they can to turn away, so you want to make it as easy as possible. What was the story early on of how you got your first sales after that big customer? So, uh, so we put up a website, as, uh, as many people do, uh, and we did a little bit of SEO, uh, and Andrew Warner at Mixergy uh, was one of our uh, early uh, kind of podcast, videocast customers. I didn't realize that. Okay. And um, yeah. he, uh, you know, he started using us for every single show that he did, right. and he provided a link back to us saying in transcription services provided by SpeechPad. And that's a model that we've replicated now with lots of customers, you know, and customers now voluntarily say, hey, um, you know, would you, would you like it if I mentioned that our transcription was done by you? And we go, wow, that'd be, you know, that'd be fantastic. We'd love that. Um, and so that's a lot of how our, our new business comes is referral business. You know, it's not a, a ton of online advertising or, or uh, things like that. Um, it's just customers who used us on a consistent basis, right. who, who liked the product and got benefit from it, and in some way um, showed our product to their users, and so we get a lot of referrals that way. You know, that's the funny thing is that's Andrew and I were talking, and that's how that's why it came up, and that's why I started using it. So, yeah, that's that's exactly it, and. Um, you know, and now, of course, we do uh, direct sales to other uh, large customers. That's kind of uh, sales as we're all familiar with. We contact the customer and sell and, and do all that. Uh, but a lot of our customers really are inbound. That's great. And so now, so when he did that, did he ask you, like, can I put it, or he just put it up? Or was that part of when you send people a transcript, does it include by speech pad? How did it... We should probably do that. Um, it's on our feature list. Um, okay. But many, um, no, many We'll customers... just do it because they love it. Yeah, we should do it. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll add that in. Yeah. People just do it because they, they want to. And, yeah, it's great. And um, they like product and, and they've yeah. had good experience or it's really helped them with their online marketing and so they um, you know like yeah exactly yeah. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about um, one of those biggest turnaround sales like someone was definitely not buying and they ended up doing it anyways and, and what you did because I, I know a lot of times we get these whether it uh, resistance from customers or maybe emails what, what happened with uh, example for SpeechPad well, we, uh, you know, so we have a lot of people come in, use the site, have a great experience. Uh, I personally uh, come in still and handle some of our customer service inquiries. Uh, one, I enjoy it. Uh, and two, it gives me a real feel for what's going on in the business. You can really tell how your product is, what kind of experience people are having uh, by just looking at the kinds of inquiries that come in and, and handling some of them yourself. Of course, we have account managers, salespeople, and so on, but it's really a nice thing for an entrepreneur to do that directly. And I remember I got up one morning and there was an email in my inbox from someone and it was a pretty tough email. You know, it was something, you know, I, they were, this person was just very upset. Uh, and I don't remember, you know, it's partly with us, partly just was clearly having a, a tough time. You know, we've all had those moments. Uh, and I was reading this email and I was personally, uh, um, you know, very hurt by the email. Uh, because it was one of those customer service moments where you go, wow, we've been just working so hard, you know, with so many happy customers, and here's someone where, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't have a good experience. And uh, I, I remember writing this person back, and I said, please give me a call. You know, I'd just love to talk about your, your issue and, and uh, what we can do. And 
Uh, about 30 minutes later, I get this phone call from a guy uh, in Australia. And, uh, you know, I'm talking to this person, and, uh, and he goes, I remember this, he goes, I forgot that there was a human being on the mm. other end of the service. And it was just one of the most memorable moments for me because, you know, it's so easy, especially on the web, to forget that behind the, the web pages and the interface and all that, there's an actual person on the other end of that transaction who's trying to deliver, you know, make their salary, do their work, do their job, and make you happy as a customer, not just at SpeechPad, but at so many companies. And it's really easy to forget that. And I just, it was very memorable for me, you know, to have him say, wow, you know, there really is a human on the other end of this thing. And I said, yeah, you know, here we are. We're just trying to deliver great transcriptions and, and make your life better. Uh, and I think he, you know, he appreciated that. And so that was one of our um, yeah. more memorable um, customer service experiences. That's great. And I do notice, I mean, on your website, you make it so easy. Like, if you look at the right-hand side, you have the email, you have a phone number. So it's like that kind of speaks to, you know, call us. We're here. We, you, can, you can address us via phone. You can email us. So it seems like very easy, and people can kind of get a hold of you anyways. You know, sometimes I have to search around for, the, for phone numbers, and I'm like, you know, that happens. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and we really want that, and uh, we really like hearing from customers. The other thing is that we found was being really responsive. Again, maybe this is back to my original experience with the voicemails and, and as an investor, but we try and get back to people as fast as we can. You know, a lot of companies, you say, you get that email that says, thank you for your inquiry. We usually respond within two business days. And you're sitting there going, you know, two business days, that's an eternity in, you know, in today's age. I need to, you know, get this answered right away. And so we really try and get back to customers really quickly, even if it's we've got your email and we've looked at your account. Here's what we found. We need to do a little more research. But it's more than just the, hey, we got your inquiry. You know, someone may get back to you. Um, we really try and be responsive, and I think that's made a big difference for the for our customer base. Yeah, for sure. So, what's Dave? What's the time when uh, you had the most pivotal sale or connection, or you hit a big milestone later on in the business? Well, we are um, right now really scaling up the business. Video has been one of the big drivers in this business. We started out doing audio transcription; that's still uh, a large part of the business. But video today for two main purposes. One is online video. So uh, content like this, uh, the VP of marketing interviewing the CTO for a product launch, uh, original content creation, all of that. You know, video is just so easy to capture now and on a relative cost basis, getting a transcription is just a very cost effective way to create original content. So that's been one big driver. The other is something called closed captioning. Uh, and with so much uh, programming going on the web now, there's a lot greater need to make sure that everything that goes online has uh, closed captioning uh, to go with it. So those have really been two big drivers. And in the last a uh, few months, um, we introduced some capabilities that really let us streamline uh, and scale up our delivery of closed captioning, timestamp video. And that uh, has made a huge difference in the kinds of customers uh, that we can go after. And we're now closing uh, you know, six-figure deals um, wow. around closed captioning, around video transcription, things like that. Um, and that's so that's amazing. been, yeah, I, I don't know if I could say it's one particular moment, um, but it's really amazing when you're in a market and you're able to introduce a little bit of technology and a little bit of workflow and you kind of have everything working and then you're able to say, okay, we can, we can go close a big deal. Yeah, so, I mean, how do you go from, you don't have to mention names of companies if you can't, but so how do you... Um, make that big connection because I mean that's not something that happens overnight. What happens yeah, to kind yeah, of get no, to that I point? Think that's that's right, and it's uh, it's not easy. You know, we we've been around for a while. Uh, we built the business up. A lot of the customers have been um, doing a handful of transcriptions a week. Right. We started to get some bigger customers about a year and a half ago. 
uh, in addition to this first very large customer. So we had experience with a very large customer. When a few more large customers came along, we said, okay, we think we're at a point mm -hmm. where the platform, the kind of the software and the people, those two parts are at sufficient scale that we could add more large customers. Because right. um, otherwise you have sort of this chicken and egg problem. You have big customers showing up, but you're sort of wondering if you can scale to meet their needs, or you don't have them showing up, so you're afraid to make the investments to scale up. So it's sort of all about having this critical mass where you have enough large customers showing up and enough infrastructure built out that you can do both those things at the same time. Uh, and so I think that's really, you know, really what happened. So what's one that you could talk about and like how they actually kind of came on board? So we, um, without mentioning their name, we sure. work with a, a large company that uh, provides a video for um, educational institutions, uh, libraries, things like that. So online, a lot of online video. Right. Um, they originally came uh, to us as a, what we call a walk-up customer, someone who found us through the website, maybe through a referral link um, or a blog post that we did. And um, you know, we look at every so every time a customer shows up, a whole bunch of us get an email that says, "You have a new customer," and it's this very exciting moment um, that says, "Here's the customer. Here's their email address. Here's their phone number." Um, and so we see all those emails come in, and you know, we look at this one, and I, I was sort of like, oh, this this one looks kind of interesting. I went and checked out their website. Um, you know, we do that with a lot of our customers still to this day. We look at the email address they put in, we go look at their website, and we go, this this could be a pretty interesting um, customer for for this reason or this other reason, you know, new use case or the company or what have you. That's a really popular site, or it's something we haven't seen before. Lots of different reasons that could make a customer interesting. This one we saw. I sent the contact an email, and I got back an email. And th this one, it turned out that they wanted to do hundreds of hours of transcription every month. In wow. fact, they want to do 500 to 1,000 hours a wow. month. Um, and so that's a lot of you know that's a lot of scale. Um, and so we. Did some integration with them. We did a pilot. All the things you do in kind of a classic enterprise sale. Um, but the thing with transcription is you're not doing it over 18 months. You're doing it over maybe a couple of months for that scale. So they're evaluating your quality. You're talking about pricing. You're talking about account management. You're talking about uh, SLA, service level agreements, all those things that a large customer wants. Um, but really, that one just came through. Someone found us uh, through the website, and we worked with them, and uh, that's how a lot of our larger customers actually find us. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you're being a little bit modest because with everything you're saying, you are kind of adding that personal touch. You're looking through everything you know, and adding that human aspect and going to their website and saying, huh, like reaching out to them and seeing how else can we help and kind of meeting the needs of that specific customer. So, yeah, maybe they found you, but it was something with you – Kind of following up and, and seeing what they're all about. We right? it's and so thanks for saying that. So we really are in there looking at the customers when they come in. You know, we're checking in as they're using the service. Um, you, you know, how's it working for you? Did it meet your needs? You know, people with specialized style guides. Um, I think everyone on the team really has this go-getter attitude, which is you know how do we delight the customer? How do we make this customer successful? And, you know, everyone's got this can-do attitude. It's amazing. You know, we've had people who were started out with us as transcribers who are now account managers, and they are in there. You know, it's Friday night at 10 p.m., and an email comes in, and you see a response from one of our account managers, you know, Friday at 10 p.m. It's a good feeling. Thank for your, you know, thanks for your message, and here you go, or, you know, what can we, how can we help, things like that. So people really do have this attitude at the company of how do we make it happen for you. 
Well, I want to ask the next question, but I don't want to brush over that because – so what's something you do to help with the culture? Because it's not like every company someone's like eager to answer you know, customer service emails at 10 p.m. Right. Like what's one yeah. thing that you do at the company that gets people motivated or you know, they're excited to do those things? Well, I think it's been said many times, but you know, you've really got to uh, lead from the front – you know, you see this in the movies, you read about this in history, but, uh, you know, my co-founders and I really are in there. You know, we get an email. If we don't see a response, we, you know, we're in there. We're responding. Um, uh, you know, I remember my co-founder, uh, Mike, sent an email, and, you know, here, here he is replying, you know, to uh, a customer service question. Um, and that's just how we do it. And so people who then move from being a transcriber to being an account manager are used to that. They're used to that level of responsiveness, and they're used to seeing us do that. And so it's just natural for them to show up and go, wow, you know, I need to respond to this right away. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's partly that. It's partly by example. And it's also just being very – it's just practical. Um, you know, just telling people being responsive is very important. They get it right away because everyone's had the bad customer service experience, and we don't want to be those guys. We don't want to be those guys you never hear from. We want to be the super responsive, you know, your, your boss told you you had to have the transcript on the site by 4 p.m. because of this marketing initiative you were doing. We got you what you needed, and you were happy. I just I love that feeling and and people really feel that so I think that's that's a big part of building the culture. Yeah. So I mean, obviously you've had a lot of success and people may be like, well, yeah, I wish I had those six figure deals and everything, but I'm having tons of problems and they maybe not sure how to overcome them. What's one of the big failures or pitfalls you've seen that you wish you would have avoided so far? Well, I think we could have done marketing uh, and sales a lot sooner than we did. Um, you know, a friend of mine uh, jokes that uh, people actually know about us now, and he does that because he's kind of elbowing me to say, hey, you know, you could still do more marketing. Um, and, you know, we recently added uh, our first real salesperson, and so Eric. And Eric uh, has that same mentality, that same culture you were talking about earlier, he shows up, he works like crazy. When we bring in a deal, he is working to get the deal closed. You know, he's talking to the customer, he's interacting with them. So it's, uh, you know, he has that same can do attitude mm -hmm. that, that kind of everyone has. But I think, you know, one thing we could have done and that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs can do is uh, you just get the word out. There is nothing like telling people that your product exists. And then having happy customers, there's just nothing to replace that. What happened like early on because you didn't get the word out? Like, did you did the company feel some kind of pain, or do you remember a time when you're just like waiting for that text or email thing? We have another customer. What was that pain you experienced? Because that's what people are experiencing now. A lot of yeah. people. What What was something like that early on? Well, I remember uh, we would, again, have these, you know, our development meetings, customer meetings, and so on, and there just wasn't that much to talk about. You know, we kept wishing there were more customers, and it's really frustrating when you feel like, I have a product, and yet, why aren't more people using it? And I remember things feeling kind of slow. And I also remember another entrepreneur telling me a number of years ago, you'll know it when you've got it. It'll feel like a rocket. And I always kind of, you know, back when I was first told that, I was like, what, what does that feel like exactly? And, you know, now I wake up and there's 10, 20 emails saying between the time I went to bed and the time I, you know, looked at my iPhone, there's 20 new customer emails just, you know, in the span of six or seven hours. And so that's an amazing feeling. You know that things are on fire when, when it's just happening like that. But, you know, you also know when things are slower than they should be. And you just got to be real honest with yourself that it should be faster. It's not. And what are the reasons for that? You know, is our website really hard to use? Our site was hard to use a few years ago. You know, are we doing marketing? No, we're not. So how would anyone know that, that we're out there? 
Do we ask our customers, hey, would you mind mentioning us or doing a, you know, tweeting about us or anything? Just mention us to a friend. Um, it's amazing what just a simple ask like that um, can do to help your business. Um, and, you know, when people are happy with your product, like you said, they'll give back and they'll try and help make you successful because they want you to be successful. Um, so I think a lot of that we could have done earlier, and now, of course, we, you know, we do a lot more of it. Yeah, I mean, and you do a lot of mentoring and things like that. What's one thing that you'd recommend the audience to do and start doing right now to start getting more sales or even their first sale to get it going? Well, um, first of all, use your own product. Um, you know, I, one of the reasons I love doing the big data landscape shows and kind of all these big data videos is I go in, I feel the pain. You know, I record the video, I have to edit it up, I have to produce it. Oh, it turned out the audio's in mono instead of stereo, and I ran into the Skype. You know, all the little things that by themselves wouldn't be an issue. But together, all those little things add into a big thing uh, and are very time consuming. And so when you use your own product, you really feel kind of the whole life cycle of the product, and you really get a sense for that. And when you show up at the development meeting, you go, you know that issue that we keep saying we'll deal with next week? You do it right away because you're feeling the pain, and there's just no, you know, there's no substitute um, for that. So I think using your own product, not just saying you're going to do it, but actually using it uh, in a very visceral way is really important. Um, I didn't know what you were going to say for that one, but I did not expect that answer. That's so be, that's great. Feel the pain of your customer and go through the customer experience because oftentimes we forget that and we're kind of looking from you know the inside and we don't see what other people see. That that's perfect. I like that. Yeah. What's another what's a tool or software or something a system you use in your life and your business that helps you to be, you know, as productive as you can be? Cuz I know you're making yeah, a lot of we, stuff at uh, once. Yeah, we use a lot of different tools. Uh we use Unfuddle for uh ticketing and trouble ticketing. So, uh you know, every time there's a, a product issue, um, we ticket that, it gets assigned to an engineer, and I think the bigger your engineering team gets and, uh, you know, the more, the more uh, pieces of the product you have, the more critical it is to be very clear about what the issue is, you know, because all too often you can say, hey, there's this product issue, we should do something about it. But turning that from a, we should do something about it, or a customer emailed us and had this specific issue, that has to become a specific ticket number and go on the work item list. Uh, so we use use Unfuddle for that. We use Google Sites for a lot of uh, information, wiki type information that we're sharing uh, with customers internally for our operations team. So uh, you know, for operations, when we onboard a new customer, uh, we're compiling lots of information about who who are the customer contacts, what are their requirements. You know, all the details that go into a great relationship with a customer, that's all going into our, uh, you know, into our online um, repository of, of information. So those are, those are some of the biggest. Of course, we're built on um, Amazon Web Services. We like that because we can scale up and down easily, and it has a lot of underlying security capabilities. Um, so all of those things really help us uh, build the business. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing those. And I want you to... I have one final question. Before I ask you that, I want you just to tell people a little bit more. Obviously, they get a little bit of idea with SpeechPad, but maybe one of the stories of a business that just can't live without it, or and maybe a little bit what you're working on now with SpeechPad. Yeah. So, um, gosh, can't live without it. So we have some um, we have some uh, educational institutions now that. Uh, take some of their online courses mm -hmm. and get those transcribed. And uh, those really truly make the, the video accessible. Um, the closed captioning capability we have now, um, that's truly a can't live without it kind of thing. We have people who are hearing impaired, watching the videos with, you know, without the closed captioning, they literally can't. Uh, incorporate or use the video. They, they can't make use of it. And so having this, this uh, 
time coding, this closed captioning capability with the transcripts really is a can't live without it kind of um, capability. So uh, I feel really, you know, really good about um, being able to offer that uh, that part of the product. Um, some of the things we're working on right now, uh, we, you know, again, more and more about video. How do we get more integrated with YouTube so that you can take your entire YouTube channel list of videos, uh, pull those into SpeechPad, and then voila, you get transcripts for your whole video library. And you can imagine that that would be incredibly useful for marketing organizations that are doing a lot of online video production. So a lot tighter integration, uh, making the workflow even more seamless, and then making the, the transcriber experience really easy. So a big part of having human beings do transcription is making it easy for them to do the transcription. So you can imagine something like Lifeline where if they didn't know a word, they could ask for help. Um, you know, we can highlight, we can have glossaries of, you know, here are the keywords. Um, lots of different things, built-in editing tools. We have a lot of this today, but I think we could go even further. Yeah. So one thing, just just uh, spell out the website just for people who are maybe just listening to it. Sure, sure. It's uh, speechpad.com, and you can go to speechpad and upload audio or video. You can put in a YouTube URL if you'd like, if, you're, if your video content's already online. Uh, you upload that, choose your turnaround time options, put in your credit card or request an invoice, and uh, you'll get your transcriptions back. Cool. And then, Dave, I have one final question for you. Now, being the author of Why Startups Fail and How Yours Can Succeed, I have to ask you this, obviously. Um, what are the two of the biggest mistakes that you've made that other founders should... You know, watch out for, and it could be with one of the previous businesses too. It doesn't have to be with Speechpad. Uh, I think number one uh, for technology is picking a small market. So you know, the thing I love about transcription is there's potentially a lot of competition, but it's a huge market. You know, if we build the right product, we deliver great customer service, we deliver great transcripts the market is really, really big, so we can continue to scale the business. So I really like that uh, and, you know, uh, about this market. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is just not getting out there soon enough. Uh, you know, it's so easy to stay in the kind of the coding mentality of building the product, and, you know, it's, it's kind of really putting yourself out there to say, okay, I'm gonna have other people try out this thing I built and they might love it, they might hate it. Uh, and again, with SpeechPad, I think we could have gotten out there a lot earlier than we did. Um, now that we, you know, now that we're marketing and we have salespeople and things like that, you know, we can really feel it. So uh, I think it's doing that um, sooner than you might feel comfortable with. So what do you think was holding you and the company back from getting out there sooner? Oh, you know, we just, uh, we were, we didn't think about marketing first and foremost. That wasn't the first thought of the day. We didn't get up and go, how do we get more customers? We got up and went, huh, this is, you know, really cool. It's really interesting. We're building a, a nice product. And at some point, we made this transition where we said, number one, the product has to sell itself. It has to be really easy to use. And two, if it's that good, we're going to want to tell people about it. And having a great product, a product, you know, just as you said earlier in the show, where people really love the product, when you're getting feedback, then people say, I love your product, and you get those emails, that really makes you want to get out there and tell people about the product. So I think having a product that you personally love and that people are telling you, customers are telling you they love the product, that kind of lights the fire under, it lit the fire under us to want to get the word out and share the product yeah. with more and more folks. I see. Yeah, so early on, you're like just worrying about product, 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 and maybe you could have incorporated a little bit more of, let's spread the word as we're just focusing as we're, as so we're doing. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, then once you get some, some positive feedback and you have your own conviction, I think that's a big part of being an entrepreneur is you always have this moment where you decide, I've got the conviction to go make this successful. And 
all of the things that go into that marketing and sales and great product and the right pricing and, and all those pieces, you know, you just wake up and you go, I'm going to make it happen. And, uh, and that's a big part of it. Yeah, I love that. And about the small market, was there a time where you remember choosing a market and then afterwards realizing it's too small? Because, I mean, a lot of people have a hard time judging, is this idea big enough? Like, should I even move forward with this? What's an example you could think of, either from you or maybe one of the, the mentor companies? Yeah, yeah. Well, an example that uh, I like to give um, and that, uh, you know, is fast food. So fast food is a huge, huge market. Does that make it a good market? No. Just because it's a really big market doesn't make it a good market for me as an entrepreneur. I don't know anything about how to make hamburgers at scale for large numbers of people and deal with food distribution and, and everything that goes into that. So there's an example where it's a big market, but it's not a good market. Um, and a good market is not only is it a large market, but it plays to your strength and it's something you're personally very passionate about. And so that's really the case with SpeechPad, uh, is it, you know, it has all of those factors. Um, a lot of times what I see from companies that I advise or mentor is someone will go after a, a very narrow problem. You know, they have, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a good example, but you know here's a tool that solves um, you know some some issue I was having on my laptop or something, and it addressed their personal need, right. but it was too narrow to be broadly applicable. Uh, you know, broadly yeah, I know exactly what you mean. To, yeah, uh, to a lot of folks, um, it was just too narrow a solution, and so when you think about transcription. Transcription is something that's applicable to lots and lots of people. Different use cases within that market, captioning versus online video versus podcast and so on. But as an overall solution, it's very, you know, it's very large. Um, and so I think that's really what you've got to ask yourself is how many other people could benefit from this if I solve the problem? How did you know with SpeechPad? Because obviously you had a personal problem. And what did you look at first to see, is this a big enough problem for me to spend a lot of my time and energy uh, doing? We, yeah, so we, uh, we looked at the market really hard before we got into it. And uh, it's a very large market measured in tens of billions of dollars. When you look at traditional captioning, uh, when you look at audio transcription, those were both very large. What really happened, what really changed, though, in the last um, two years, I would say, is that... Uh, Online video just took off. I mean, online video, just like what we're doing right now, is on fire. And so when you layer that in on top of audio, traditional audio transcription, on top of captioning, you know, online video is just this incredible driver. It's like this wave that, that is pushing our business and other businesses. And that, um, you know, that's an amazing thing when you have that additional driver um, to kind of catapult the business to the next level. Yeah. All right. So listen to Dave. Make sure you don't have a small market and just get your, your product out there. Dave, I want to be the first one to thank you. And I want everyone just to, you should just take a, whatever it is, um, some kind of audio or video and go through their checkout process and just purchase. And just, even if it's five or 10 minutes or whatever the clip is, just try it and see how seamless it is. It's amazing. You can incorporate that in your website and in your business too. So Dave, thank you so much for your time. I really